Hello and thank you to the early birds getting in uh, nice and quickly there. We're just going to give it a few moments for the, uh, the other attendees to, to fill up. But thank you very much for joining us today. Really excited to find out a little bit more about life at Bumble. Um, you might notice we've got a big call today. So we've got plenty of opinions, um, all sorts of different <coughs> backgrounds and positions within Bumble. So should be able to give uh, everyone out there a really, really good insight into what life is like at Bumble, uh, both on a day to day level and uh, and from a tech perspective as well of course <clears throat> so just a few uh, introductions as we get started so i'm phil i work at hacker job hacker job is a data driven uh, and engaging recruitment platform operating in the digital sector we use key data points to find candidates jobs based on based uniquely on their cv and skill sets um, ensuring both candidates and companies can conduct more relevant and targeted approach to recruitment um, beyond that we offer support on interviews as well um, as well as offering candidates the opportunity to show off their skills through challenges and project uploads. <clears throat> Today we're joined with uh, by Bumble. Um, so Bumble is the parent company of Badu and Bumble, <clears throat> two of the world's highest grossing dating apps with millions of users with, worldwide. Uh, Bumble's mission is to create a world where all relationships are healthy and equitable. Uh, they build technology that will leave a lasting impact on society for good. Um, and through their work, they believe the internet can become a kinder and more respectful place for people to contact each other um, and build relationships. <clears throat> Just a few bits of, of housekeeping before we start. So please, please use the Q&A feature. If you have any questions, please don't raise your hand. We unfortunately won't be able to get around to raised hands. Um, we have loaded up all the questions we've received by email um, onto a Slido link, which should be shared in the chat. Um, please have a look at those questions and you can use the thumbs up feature to vote for, for questions you really want to, uh, to find out the answer to. Um, but luckily, I think we will have time to get through all of the questions that have been submitted beforehand. So should be able to give everyone the, the insight they were looking for when submitting those questions. Um, cool. So, yeah, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Amy Turner, who's the employer brand manager at Bubble. Hello, thank you, Phil. Hi, everyone. So as Phil said, my name is Amy. My pronouns are she, her and hers, and I am Bumble's Employer Brand Manager based in London. So today I am joined by quite a few of our developers um, who you will have the chance to meet afterwards. There's a few of them on the screen there. I'm not going to introduce them all now, but they are here to answer your questions. But before we get to that, I'm just going to spend about 10 minutes or so running you through a few slides and giving you an overview of Bumble and what our culture is all about. So Bumble is the parent company that owns Bumble app and Badoo app, which are two of the world's largest dating and connection apps with millions of users globally. Hopefully you have heard of us and maybe you've even used one of our apps before. Our mission is to create a world where all relationships are healthy and equitable. And that mission really is at the heart of everything that we do. On a day-to-day -day basis, we are guided by our company values, which are growth, make the first move, honesty, kindness, accountability, and inclusivity. And these values underpin how we act, how we operate, how we communicate with each other, how we do everything really, as we work towards achieving our mission. So a really quick history of our company. The company was founded in 2006 with the launch of our first dating app, Badoo. In 2014, the Bumble app followed and was launched as the first women-led dating app on the market. Then in 2019, the company was acquired by Blackstone and the Bumble app founder, Whitney Wolfhead, became CEO of our entire group. And in 2020, the group was renamed as Bumble. We also opened our fourth office location in 2020, which is in Barcelona. And that, that's uh, to accompany our other offices, which we have in London, Austin and Moscow. And then in Feb 2021, so just a few months ago, Bumble went through an IPO, which was a truly remarkable day for everyone in the business and a really amazing achievement in the midst of a pandemic. So this is a photo of our founder and CEO, Whitney wolf -Herd, with her baby son in her arms as she rang the NASDAQ bell. And she made history by becoming the youngest woman CEO to take a company public. So you may have seen this covered in the news. It did get quite a lot of attention. And it was a very, very inspiring day for everybody in the business. I think everybody felt extremely proud of everything that we'd achieved. And we celebrated virtually with gift boxes. So we all got sent some merch and some sweet treats. And we even had the chance to have our photo on a billboard in Times Square, which I thought was really cool and I really enjoyed. So it really was a memorable and remarkable day. 
On that day, Whitney delivered a really powerful speech about where Bumble's come from and where it's heading. I'm just going to play the last 30 seconds of that speech for you now, because I think it gives you a really good idea of what Whitney stands for and what Bumble is all about. You're in. We are humbled and grateful to be with you today, and we look forward to building the future of love, friendship, networking, and community as we chip away at archaic gender dynamics and make the internet a kinder and more accountable place. In closing, I want to thank the remarkable women who paved the way for Bumble in the public markets. By supporting and championing each other, we can break down barriers for the next generation of women and other marginalized communities. We cannot wait to cheer them on. Welcome to Bumble Inc. and thank you. So hopefully that gives you a really good idea of what Whitney stands for, how, how passionate she is and how committed to our values and our mission she really is. And that really does trickle down through everything that happens in the business. You're in. So Bumble Inc. is two apps. There is Bumble, whose mission is to make the first move, and Badoo, whose mission is to date honestly. And both of these products work towards our overall mission of creating healthy and equitable relationships for everyone. And the products are built by the same team of engineers on a shared infrastructure and between them they're available in 150 countries and 50 languages all around the world. And Bumble really is a company that you can feel proud to work for. Our commitment to our mission has been recognised and in April this year we were named on the first ever Time 100 Most Influential Companies list for designing a smarter, safer dating app, which is an amazing accolade. So that is a little bit about our company. So let's dive into our culture. And I'm going to play you a 60 second video now so that you can hear from some of our global team members, because who better to tell you about our culture than the people in the company themselves? I have to say, working at Bumble, that three words is impossible to do. I don't know how I'm going to do this. Uh, the culture at Bumble is empowering, open, and more than anything, it's fun. Community is the main word that, that comes to mind, and I think community is sort of the umbrella word, and under that are so many other words. But when you work for Bumble, if you give an inch, you'll get a mile back from the people that work there. Kindness, um, respect, um, and openness. I would go with the three words, so the kind of statements that doors always open. At Bumble, I can work freely and without any kind of ties. You know, support and creativity and fun and um, scrappy and exciting. So that was some of our employees uh, talking about how they would describe Bumble or the culture of Bumble in three words. And as you can see, they were all filmed from home and the series was called Making Moves From Home as we have, like everyone else, many people navigated working virtually during. I have to say, sorry, let me just skip. I have to say, <laughs> so on the subject of working from home and working during the pandemic, I wanted to highlight a few of the ways that Bumble have really tried to keep everyone motivated, engaged, and supported through what's been quite a tricky time. So flexible working is one thing that we introduce. You know, we really recognise that everyone's situation is different, and we support working hours to suit our people. So parents who are working from home with children, for example, may need to work slightly different hours to what they were previously. And we're really supportive of that. We also take everyone through a fully digital onboarding process and we send equipment straight to your home. We introduced First Fridays, uh, one of everyone's favorites, I think, where employees receive a takeaway voucher or food delivery to enjoy lunch with their team. And that happens on the first Friday of every month. We also set up random coffee. So this is something you can opt into and you're paired with an employee at random and you set up a 15 to 30 minute informal chat and it's just a chance to get to know other people at the, across the business and just to talk about something that's not a meeting and not work. So it could be anyone from Bumble, from any country, any team, uh, any level. I recently got paired with Bumble CMO. So you really can get paired with absolutely anybody and it's a great way to get to know a colleague from the wider business. We also stream free live yoga and meditation classes to help people unwind. And we've also held some other kind of ad hoc workshops as well. So at Christmas, we did a wreath making workshop and I know there's been a sushi making workshop. So there's lots of fun activities that you can sign up to take part in. 
We also have an internal hackathon called Bumble Hack, which happens twice a year. And it's open to every employee in the business, not just developers. So we select employees to become judges, to become mentors. And we also ask the wider business to watch the final presentation and vote for the winner on the day. So there really is a way for everybody to get involved. And they're really fun events, normally with some food. Uh, obviously, if we were in person, we would have pizza and beer and that kind of thing. But we make the best of it virtually. But we're really excited to get back in and do one IRL as well. And then the most recent initiative we introduced was Focus Fridays. So that is the last Friday of every month. We have no meeting, no deadline, no slack day so that you can use that time to focus in the best way for you. So whether that's getting your head into a spreadsheet without any distractions, doing some personal development or just taking time away from your computer, you can really use that to, to focus on yourself. And then Buzzword. So this is an internal speaker series, but I'm going to touch on that in just a moment. So I also wanted to mention our really strong engineering culture. So engineering makes up about 60% of our business and it's spread across London, Moscow and Barcelona. It is a truly global and talented team. So we sponsor and attend a lot of international and local conferences and events, less so over the last year, sadly, but typically you would see us there. Um, we encourage our engineers to write articles, to attend and host meetups and AMAs, and of course to do events like we're doing today. We also have a tech blog on Medium and the URL is on the screen there. So if you're interested in joining our engineering team, I really do suggest taking a look at that blog and seeing what our engineers, engineers have been up to. And there are plenty of great benefits to working at Bumble. Um, I'm gonna highlight a few of, of the key ones here. So we have private medical and dental insurance. Uh, we have pension, we have enhanced parental leave, and we have a learning and development budget as well. We also get loads of merch. So if you like any of the Bumble merch you can see, then this is a good way to get your hands on it. Um, and that's because we really do believe the best way to create a more healthy and equitable world is by starting within. And uh, if you want to learn more about our benefits, go to team.bumble.com and you'll be able to view the benefits available by region in detail there. I also wanted to just touch on diversity, equity and inclusion, because this is a really important topic and it's something that is um, at the heart of everything we do as a business. So we really do believe that everyone has a seat at the table. So I wanted to highlight a few of the things that we're doing to foster a culture of inclusivity within the business. First of all, we set up some strategic partnerships with organisations such as Power to Fly, She Can Code and Glad. And this is all about making sure that we're getting our brand and who we are in front of as a diverse audience as possible so that we can improve our diversity going forward. We offer unconscious bias training internally. And we also have our buzzword series, which I mentioned earlier. So this is a series of internal events featuring speakers from underrepresented groups to educate employees and build community. We also have an employee resource group called the Diverse Bees, and anyone in the business can join this group. And it's to share resources and experiences and it acts as a sounding board as well. So any content or campaigns that are launched internally or externally, Diversities will offer their honest opinions and feedback um, on this. So for example, a lot of Diversities members contributed to the development of our antibody shaming policy, which was a new feature implemented on both Bumble and Badoo apps to ban body shamers from our apps. And that was released quite recently and a lot of people gave their feedback towards that. So as well as kind of be, being a space and a community also helps empower the business as well. Jolt, would you like to make like a small introduction about uh, the chapter and what is the role of committee? Sure. Hi everyone, my name is Jolt and I'm the Android chapter lead here at Bumble. Uh, so what is a chapter? We are organized in cross-functional teams in the company that we call pods. And the goal of a pod is to ideate and execute autonomously with um, some small support from other teams. But then uh, each pod is autonomous and led by one engineering manager and a product manager. So um, a common setup for a pod is that you would have an iOS, an Android, a server developer, and so on. But because of this, uh, you don't have a single team of Android developers or iOS developers, so that they are spread across these pods. And then you would want to have some kind of alignment space where each of the, the developers sharing the same discipline could align themselves. And this is what we call chapters. So all Android developers are automatically part of the Android chapter. All iOS developers are automatically part of the iOS chapter. And we have our own communication channels and meetings where we make common decisions that apply for all the pods and all the teams. Alexis, maybe you want to move on to how we organize work in the chapter. 
Yes, thank you, Jolt. Uh, hi, everyone. So I'm Alexis Santos, and I'm a, I'm also um, part of a chapter. I'm the iOS chapter lead. Um, basically, as the teams grew a lot uh, during the last years, um, and the chapter is uh, quite large. We decided to find uh, very important areas where we could create, uh, where we could divide the chapter in meaningful uh, teams that we call committees. And in, or on each of these committees, we discuss uh, different areas of the iOS department. And we have, uh, we start projects and we create initiatives and we take care of each of these areas. Um, today, we have two persons that will represent some of these areas. Uh, in iOS, we will have uh, Chitra from the UI committee, which is about user interfaces. And then we have Radek from the architecture committee. I think uh, by, from Android, we also have some people. Jules, maybe you want to introduce them. Yes, we have Simona from the Android UI committee here. And we have Gail and myself from the architecture committee here. Grant. Thank you. Yeah, I think we can proceed with the uh, next section. Into the questions. Excellent. Thank you very much for, for bearing with. So now the exciting bit. Uh, we've got obviously all the questions that you guys have, have, have uh, submitted via Slido beforehand. Um, and obviously towards the end of the, of the, the webinar, we are going to come on to some questions that um, have maybe been added during the, 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 the webinar. But first question, um, so this is the Jolt. Uh, so is there crossover between the iOS and Android development at, at Bumble at the moment? Um, that's a funny question. I, I understand it as whether we do uh, cross-platform development as a technology. Um, we, do, we do native development. So we do native Android and native iOS. There's no cross-platform cross on the level of uh, coding, but we do have crossovers in between the two chapters. So there's lots of um, similar challenges uh, or best practices that we can share. We have frequent sync with, with Alexis and we share the best practices while happening inside iOS chapter and Android chapter and we also aim to launch a few cross chapter activities for the next half a year fantastic excellent and so when you're looking for for, for new people or, or when you join the business are you expected to have a knowledge of kind of cross platform development beforehand or is that something that people kind of settle into as they as they join the business and kind of get upskilled in, in, in that particular area um not sure i understand the question so th we don't do cross native cross-platform development. So we don't expect that. We only expect native knowledge, native for Android and native for iOS. Fantastic, excellent. Um, cool, and then for the next question, I think we were gonna go to Alexis first um, on the iOS side of things. So what's the process for creating updates for the app? So yes, as I understood the question, uh, we are speaking about the release train um, or the release process for delivering the application. So in our company, we follow a very similar process between iOS and Android um, that is based on a release train. It means that every week um, we create a release branch. Um, we release the application to our uh, final users on a weekly basis and unless there is some unexpected uh, problem or holidays or, or some, something like that in between. But in general, we aim for that. This is good for us because it allows uh, our team and our product team as well, on not only engineering, but other areas to understand exactly when any feature could be uh, delivered. So they can plan in advance uh, these deliveries and uh, they can aim for a specific date if they want to start uh, something uh, live in a specific, like an, in any specific week or month. Uh, so this is an advantage for us. It's working very well uh, at the moment. Um, so I think Simona can tell a bit more about that. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, so basically to just add to that, we also have um, two additional, um, two different iOS and Android uh, engineers on duty every week. Um, these people, um, these release managers, as we call them, they wait for a green light from each automation team that we have before submitting um, each app for um, release. And on top of that, what they do is they keep an eye on any issues after the submission that might come up. 
Um, and for me personally, I have to say that I think it's really cool that all get devs get to have this chance to, to participate in this release process. Um, they, they take turns and they pretty much share responsibility of being like the watchman for the app. So um, I think it's really cool. Fantastic. Excellent. And I think next time, next question, we just want to dig in a little bit to the, the tech stack. So, uh, Gail, perhaps you could tell me a little bit about the, the tech stack that you use within Android and also how did you choose it? Because I know tech selection is something that um, our listeners are always, always very interested in. Yeah, sure. I, I can take that question on, on Android. Um, so for our tech stack, um, basically as a, as a programming language, I guess it won't be a surprise, but uh, we use Kotlin. 100% um, for, for new features and in terms of um, architecture we use uh, RIBS um, which is um, a framework that we uh, have uh, in-house that which was uh, originally um, the fork from, from Uber's RIBS uh, but I guess there's another question about this so we'll go in a bit into more details later about it. Um, we also use MVI um, as an architectural pattern um, we do have uh, RX Java uh, extensively in, in our code base, and we use a uh, room uh, in some places of, of our project for data persistence. Uh, so these are the main components of our um, tech stack, uh, mainly for the architecture part. And we also have some specificities regarding the UI, uh, but maybe Simona can take this part since she's part of the, of the UI community. Yes, please do. Yeah, sure. So um, in terms of UI, we, we, um, we have a massive design system in place, which we can talk about a bit more in detail later. Um, but this is basically our main source of truth for anything UI related. Um, we also have a number of in-house solutions, like for example, for um, our own image loading uh, and caching library. Um, and aside from that, I think it's worth mentioning testing. Like we, we have a lot of different um, testing levels and most notably we we do a lot of unit testing um, UI integration tests visual regression tests um, and we're also really proud of our um, Q&A processes and these produce a lot of um, functional end-to-end -end tests um, I think that's the few points to mention fantastic excellent and Radoslav if you could give us some insight into the, the iOS side of things and also the, the tech selection process and how you kind of came to decide on, on this to be the, the correct tech stack to use. Oh yeah, Th thank you. And <clears throat> hello everyone. So for, for iOS also probably no surprises, uh, but maybe a bit of surprise because we have a quite an old code base. So using Swift for most of the stuff is uh, it's maybe not as common. Uh, I don't know, but uh, for we're using mostly Swift and Swift only for the new features. And we have few isolated Objective-C uh, modules as well uh, and also like a fun fact a bumble app is purely swift but we came up from objective c uh, back in the days right so uh, for ui layer we're using ui kit but directing ourselves into uh, swift ui with with the time right so that's our direction but for now it's still ui kit um, and i guess some lower levels is uh, for persistency we use the app database for networking we use uh, protobuf um, yeah, and many, many of the items we use uh, or logic parts we use in the app are uh, in-house solution, like modularization is in-house. Um, uh, we have some reactive APIs, which is also in-house and analytics is uh, in-house as well. So can, can't share too much about it. Um, yeah, and also maybe a um, very interesting point is how we test our UI. It's currently a Facebook uh, visual snapshot test, but we are directing towards point three. Um, yeah, that's that's all. Right, thank you very much. Um, excellent, so Chitra, I think we're going to come to you next. Um, so, do you work with Scrum and Agile? And um, if so, you know, what's your opinion on on, on both of those topics? Uh, yes, yeah, so we do work with Agile in the sense that we have some cross-functional teams who are focused on a particular user need. For instance, I work on day zero experience. That will be another good, which would work on chat and so on. So we are broadly divided into cross-functional teams uh, who try to you know, develop products to, to affect the metrics in those areas. Um, whether we work in Scrum, 
within Agile or not. So this can depend from pod to top pod. So all pods have fair amount of autonomy about how they would like to work. Uh, for instance, our platform team tends to work with Scrum that they have two weeks, you know, uh, sprint set up and they have some goals for that. Whereas our pod tries to work with features, it's all product oriented. So it, it can, there is fair amount of autonomy in that sense. But yes, we are working with Agile and I think it, it, is, it is broadly working very well for us. Fantastic. So it's a bit of a, a best tool for the job type situation, which I think is always the, the right approach to, to go with. Excellent. Um, you could get some insight into the, the architectural side of things as, as well, uh, particularly on the, the Android side of things. Um, so I know Gail and, and Jolt, I think you've both got uh, some, some great opinions on this. So yeah, if either one, one of you wants to jump in and tell us a little bit about the architecture that you're using on the, the Android side of things, that'd be great. Right. So as, as Gail mentioned earlier in the tech tech question, we have MVI core and drips. Uh, these are our two main pieces for architecture. Both of them are actually open source projects of ours and they really nicely complement each other. So ribs is our large scale, large scale application architecture, which is connecting product features with each other. And it provides us with a lot of scalability. It's really nice. And it's also important to mention that it makes no assumption about what kind of architecture pattern that you want to use in any of the product feature implementations. So it can be MVI, MVVM, MVP, up to you. And then we use MVI core as part of implementing these individual uh, product features. And we use it mainly for maintaining business logic. But probably Gail can tell a bit more uh, about MVI core. Yeah, sure, I can jump on, on MVI Core. So yeah, as its name implies, uh, MVI Core is based on um, the MVI uh, architectural pattern um, and therefore on the unidirectional data flow um, concept, which basically means that um, the data can only flow in, in one direction and that the state can only be modified at one place only, uh, which is a single source of truth. and um, makes your, your state uh, be uh, consistent and, and, and reliable. Um, and the cool thing with uh, MVI core is that apart from providing you the tool that uh, will generate that uh, consistent state, uh, it also comes with um, stateless uh, event handling solutions. Um, so for example, if you have some um, one-off events uh, that you want to use to trigger, I don't know, a snack bar um, or a toast, for example. Um, so we, we support that as well. And we also have um, a utility that supports automatic scoping, uh, which uh, can actually be pretty useful. And okay, so thank you very much. Um, um, and then on the iOS side, so Radisson, I know you mentioned obviously Swift UI a little bit beforehand, um, but if you could maybe give us some insight and in kind of what architecture um, you are, are, are kind of adopting alongside uh, alongside Swift UI, that'd be great. Yeah, so we, we fall in love with Swift UI. It's, it's an amazing, amazing framework, and we would really like to start working with, with it. But currently, we are kind of blocked on OS version still, unfortunately. So at this point, we're just experimenting with that idea. And uh, yeah, so, and the closest thing we want to do is uh, we want to apply approaches that we currently have with UIKit as well, like very similar ones, which uh, in our case would be a slightly modified MBVM pattern uh, to separate the UI from, from the logic. And this is the direction we want to go. Obviously, on the early stages, we'll probably go with the isolated features and isolated views and try to kind of experiment how the both frameworks would interrelate and how we can connect them. Excellent, thank you very much, Radislav. Um, great, so I think next question is kind of digging into, um, I guess the, the complexity of, of, of running two systems. So how do you maintain the consistency in such a big code base um, within each platform, but also kind of between them and, and making sure that they, uh, they play nicely together? So Simona, if you could give us some insight on that, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Um, so the main thing to mention here, I think, is is um, the previously mentioned design system. And I also think one of the uh, live Q&A questions ask, actually asked a bit more info on this. So it's great that this is kind of aligned. Um, I will just for note, I will actually post um, a link to our tech blog series that actually describes this in, in a lot of detail. And you can see the path from 
the initial start of designing this design system to the end result. So I think it'll give you the best info, but just to touch, like briefly touch upon it, it's, it's um, the fact that we have this such a massive, uh, fairly massive design system, uh, which is called Cosmos. Um, it serves as like a complex ecosystem, a combination of component and or view uh, libraries um, as a, it uses as a style guide, um, collection of documentation, processes around all of this, um, tooling, pipelines for updating like dimension or image assets. Um, it's, it's quite complex and it's quite, um, quite an interesting system. It's very, um, these sort of design systems vary a lot depending on, on the company that uses them. So they can be quite individual, um, but this is ours. Um, this helps us ensure the maximum consistency between uh, different platforms. Um, it helps us with the simplicity in development as well. And it also um, helps a lot with design and, and uh, reusability generally. Um, on top of that, I think what, what is important to mention for this question of consistency is that we also have a lot of testing in place, but most notably, I would say that um, for this, we use visual regression tests. Um, this is basically a tool that takes a screenshot of a page or a specific section of the page, and then it, um, it compares it before and after these changes were made. It compares it basically with the baselines that we have in place. Um, if you want more info on the design system, as mentioned, I'm going to post a link and you can take a look and read through it. That's grand. Thank you very much, Simone. And we can make sure that, <clears throat> that the link goes out in the follow-up email that we'll send out after this webinar as well. So if anyone does miss it right now, uh, we can follow up with that afterwards. Because yeah, I think that sounds like some really good insights. Um, fantastic. So Alexis, it'd be good to come to you next. So um, be interested to get some insight in how you're navigating developing in iOS 14.5, um, particularly with the new app tracking transparent clause. Um, is this affecting your work? Ah, thank you for the question. Um, I will try to focus this answer in two different parts uh, because this app uh, tracking system, uh, yeah, it can affect the engineering part of the things and also the product side or metrics. So I can say that from engineering side, it's not affecting us too much because we knew about these changes in advance and we prepare our application to support them. Um, we implement it, we sent it to Apple, provided all the information that they requested and everything went quite smooth in my opinion. So now it's not causing any problems, but on the side of the product, um, unfortunately I cannot tell about details but because I don't really know, but basically as uh, I got, uh, of course, like in the same case as for any other company who has some marketing, or uh, uses marketing to promote their applications, there may be uh, some parts affected. I don't think it's gonna be a massive problem, but uh, yeah, for sure, like the same that will happen to any other company that has marketing, it will affect uh, in some areas. Fantastic, thank you, Alexis. Um, and, and yeah, just to dig in a little bit more, I guess, into um, the open source nature of, of the work that, you, that the team are doing at, at Bumble. Um, Jot, it'd be great to come to you and just find out, are you involved in any open source, source project, either internally or, or externally during your, your time at Bumble? We are, and proudly so. So both MVI Core and RIPS are open source projects of ours. And we also have quite a few upcoming uh, interesting projects. I can think of three, which I cannot mention yet, but will be released in the upcoming months. So stay tuned. And if you would follow us on Twitter or Medium, you will get notified when we release them. Fantastic. Excellent. Um, and, and Alexis, it'd be great to get your insight on the iOS side of things. Yes, um, the same as Android. Basically, we are very involved uh, every time we have the opportunity. So we have internal uh, open source projects like Chato that is created from our team back in the days and we still maintain it and we use it internally as well. And then we also collaborate with other repositories that uh, other people created, like for example, uh, SwiftLint, where we uh, sent some pull requests recently, I think last month and it was approved and now it's merged. So we are trying to collaborate with the community as much as we can. Every time we see an opportunity, we try to take it and we try to uh, also help. So stay tuned as uh, Joel said, because more is coming on the way. 
Awesome. And yeah, on that topic, if there are any repos or any, any GitHubs in particular that you'd like us to share afterwards, we're welcome to, to, to share those up by our email as well, because I think it's always a really powerful thing when you can actually look at, at the code and, 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 and see what's being created beforehand, particularly when you're deciding on, on your next company. Um, fantastic. Gail, so it'd be great to, to come to you now. So staying in the same sort of ballpark, um, looks like you've built a lot of your own libraries when it comes to the architecture on the Android side. Um, why did you invest in this instead of going with the, the more mainstream ones? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I, actually, like, I, I don't believe that there is such a thing as a silver bullet uh, architecture. And I think that a mainstream technology uh, can be great or not um, for you, uh, but it doesn't uh, automatically mean that it's going to fit your needs. Um, and that's actually what uh, happened uh, at Bumble. The, like the solutions that we saw were out there uh, at the time we went uh, for building our own libraries were not uh, convenient for us. So that's why we decided to invest in our own solutions. Um, and that's why we decided to build libraries that uh, fit our specific needs. And today we, we're very satisfied with it. Uh, Jolt, maybe you wanna add something to this. That's a great question, by the way. And I would say that all companies invest in their own architecture. Maybe they don't publish it as a library, but internally you still need to figure out how to apply these mainstream tools and patterns so that they can scale. So it's one thing to write a to-do app and it's another thing to write uh, this scale of an application that we're working on. And if you use with any kind of architectural uh, patterns, MVP, MVI, MVVM, whatever, in the end, they are just tools and, and patterns, but how to build them into something that scales to the level where you have 50 engineers sharing the same code base uh, and doesn't become a huge, huge mess, that's another problem. And that's really worth investing in. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, Chitra, it'd be good to come back to you again. So I know Radistav mentioned earlier that a lot of the development on the iOS side is very Swift focused. Um, are you using Flutter at all at the moment or is that something that you've got lined up for the future? Uh, so for the moment, it's completely native development. So it's all Swift right now. Uh, having said that, all the cross-platform technologies are constantly on radar in the company. So there is always some experimentation going on. You know, uh, there was some experimentation with React Native and so on. Um, but for now, uh, the, after weighing some pros and cons of the, you know, two ways of doing this, uh, there, there has always been a unanimous decision that it, it is way better to go with native for now, the way the, the things stand. Um, so yeah, for now it is Swift only. Fantastic. And I think that matches up to kind of what we're seeing in the marketplace as well. I think uh, we were expecting to see a big influx in Flutter jobs and, and Flutter developers by, by this point, but to be honest, it's still very, very slow um, on, on that side of things. Still, I think a lot of companies are still uh, preferring to use, use Swift and, and native technologies, particularly on the iOS side. Mm -hmm. um, Fantastic. So it'd be good to get some insight into uh, whether you're looking to adopt Jetpack Compose on the Android side of things. Uh, so I think Simona or, or Jean? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, definitely is the short answer. Um, I think like since our, as mentioned again, the design system that we have in place, uh, we, we kind of try to mirror this design system in our in our code base by mirroring the exact components or views that come from that. And um, for this specific use case, the declarative approach that, that Compose uh, provides is gonna be a great match for us. Um, we're currently at the stage of exploring and initially implementing Compose um, as we really wanna make sure that we make the right decisions from a very early, um, from the very beginning. So um, we're hoping to adopt it as soon as possible and um, get some valuable information um, that we can potentially share, uh, some insight that we can share through our um, tech blog. So I guess uh, stay tuned for a bit more info on that, I think. Yeah. Fantastic. Was there I, I think, about that, yeah, I think Joel. Nothing much to add there, really. We are super excited about Compose and um, yeah, maybe this is another cool thing why you want uh, might want to join us. We were also among the first uh, adopters of Kotlin. While many companies uh, lag behind that later, we've been using Kotlin as a mainstream language for four years now. And we've been exploring Compose for a couple of months now. So pretty much as soon as it becomes stable, we will be uh, close to using it. 
Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, and now it'd be great to get some insight into the types of projects uh, that have, have gone on in the past. So, uh, Radhastaf, we can come to you first. Um, what type of projects have you been involved in? What's kind of the most challenging project you've worked on at Bumble? Okay, that's that's a very good question. Very broad one. <clears throat> so, uh, I work in the company for quite a long time. So, a few years already, I, I touched a lot of projects. Although maybe I will answer this one in slightly inverted way. I never work on the payments though. So don't know what's the reason, but I never work on the payments. I touch almost everything else. Um, yeah, and for the most challenging one, I always recall one project, which is, uh, which kind of like uh, put a mark on me after it was uh, on the early days of vector animations when like Facebook introduced the keyframes, uh, if I remember correctly for the small reactions on the bottom of the Facebook posts. So we, we decided to, to get exactly the same idea, idea for the app. And we wanted to have like a very cool uh, loaded uh, animation for, for starting the app. And it had like multiple stages and everything like very, very cool one. And yeah, and like it was very challenging for us because we needed to pick the library or write an in-house solution again. So yeah, like very, very detailed uh, analyze of, of the problem. Plus later on after we actually picked the uh, Lottie for that. And uh, after like we needed to work with the designers to, to get this done. And this was really fun because uh, I'm not sure if anyone work on the, on those types of animations, you actually get like a JSON with the description of the animation inside. And this JSON is very much encrypted or like shortified. So you kind of get like uh, those shortcut uh, ideas like R, A, B, that stands for something like a color or or a point in the in the space, right? So this was very fun. And, and after that, the, the gratification was very cool because after a month, I believe, the animation was played in one of the video clips of, of some Russian pop star, which was very cool to actually see this animation live uh, on the video. So yeah, I remember that one. Perfect. Thank you very much, Radoslav. Uh, and Gail, it'd be great to come to you and get your insight on that as well. Yeah, sure. So I, I haven't actually been working uh, as long as Radek uh, in the company. I haven't worked on so many exciting projects. I've been working on only one, actually, but uh, I have to say it's been pretty, pretty challenging. Um, so just to give you a little bit of context, um, the feature that uh, I've been working on is called Night In. Um, so basically, uh, Bumble is a dating app, uh, as you all know, um, and inside of this dating app, you have the possibility to have a video chat um, with um, the other person. And the feature that we built is built on top of the video chat and uh, gives you the possibility to play some, some game um, and more specifically a, a trivia game so that you can have fun uh, together with your date on, on a virtual date. Um, so the first thing is that the feature itself is uh, quite complex uh, technically, um, since it takes a lot of synchronization uh, with uh, backend with the other uh, counterpart as well, uh, time synchronization, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So technically it was really challenging and you have to add uh, on top of this, the fact that the team that built it uh, was uh, mainly made up of uh, new joiners. So I'm part of the um, Barcelona uh, team. Uh, I joined in October. Um, last year as the first mobile engineer. And uh, I, like the, the team actually started one month before that. So yeah, like maybe 80% of the team was made of new joiners. So it was kind of complex since you don't know the architecture, you don't know the processes of the company or, or anything. Um, but I have to say that um, like the company has been amazing um, here because um, the company took people from other teams to incorporate them in our team so that they could lead, uh, lead us um, and show the way uh, on how to do things uh, at Bumble. And apart from that, for anything that we may um, have needed, uh, like there was always somebody that was um, here to help. So I have to say that it, it started it started being a bit frightening for everyone, but in the end, it was like a super cool and, and super challenging project. Perfect. Thank you very much, Gail. <clears throat> and that's a great segue um, into our, our next brief section where we're going to learn a little more about the culture at, at Bumble. Um, already got some great insight there from, from Gail. So, uh, Amy, if you could maybe tell us a little bit about the, the team size and the team structure that you're working with at the moment. Yeah, so within the engineering team, 
we are now uh, organized in sort of cross-functional teams that are called pods and the goal of a pod is to ideate and execute autonomously with small support from other teams so each pod is led by one engineering manager and one product manager and the most common setup is a mix of ios android server qa design bi and product so they're really really cross-functional um and the size of the pod will vary depending on the goals but typically it could be around 10 people so then pods are then organized into collectives so within the business we have different collectives which relate to different areas of the business so for example bumble date is one of our collectives and then that is also led by an engineering lead and a product lead um so this is kind of a new process within the business um i don't know if anyone else has anything to add as the people on this call are the ones working amongst the pods and collectives um but that's kind of the structure and in terms of, of number so our engineers we're well over 300 engineers now, and we're based across uh, London, Moscow, and our new office in Barcelona. So it is, as I said before, a truly global team. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, excellent. And I think we're going to come to Satvia next. So um, if one of our, our listeners out there wanted to join Bumble, what could they expect uh, from the interview process, um, any lengthy tech tests involved, and, and, and things like that? Hey, how you doing? Um, yeah, so our interview process is pretty much broken down into sort of two different stages. Um, there's four parts to this. So th um, what the candidates could probably, the first round will be sort of an engagement with the one of the representatives of the recruitment team. Um, but then the interview process in itself will be broken down into two stages. First part is a theory-based um, interview and meet with one of the developers where they were just kind of talking about a bit more in depth around the particular platform, be it iOS or Android, uh, and talk about the language specifics. Um, it will be kind of a, a, you know, based around kind of a series of questions um, and, and typically a conversation. Um, if things go well from that, you're probably looking at around about 45 to one hour. We will then also be arranging concurrently a code pairing session as well with another developer um, again, you know, the idea being we want to keep the, the process quite engaging uh, and interactive. So um, we don't have any online um, tests as such for people to kind of filter through. This is always very much a one on one um, basis with one of the, the engineers from the, the um, an iOS or Android team. Should everything go successful from from those stages, we then have kind of essentially the final round, which consists of system design. Um, which will be one of our lead engineers, and then a, a cultural or leadership interview, um, with one of the, the head of engineering or head of collectives. Um, and ultimately then, you know, we'll you know, endeavor to come, you know, huddle up and make a decision within 24, 48 hours um, of that interview process to be done. Fantastic, nice uh, human-led process, not relying too much on, on, on you know, take-home tech tests and things like that, which is, is, to be honest, what I like to hear. Um, so yeah, to anyone out there listening that is interested, I can only encourage you to, to get in touch. Like I said, we'll follow up with an email afterwards, um, which will let you know how to get in touch with. Yeah, people. just, um, if we, yeah, just, in terms of like people who are interested, um, you know, we're always more than happy to have a kind of an initial informal conversation before if anyone might, um, is, planning to make a, a formal application. Um, so I'll definitely encourage anyone to either reach out directly to me via LinkedIn um, or even one of my team members and Simon Pinner, uh, and we can definitely sort of have those kind of conversations first and foremost, just to ensure that candidates are fully aware of, of what the role is and sort of, I guess, the, um, you know, the expectations um, and also what we can offer them as well. I think that's quite you know, crucial for, you know, for us to kind of portray that. Perfect. Thank you very much, Satvia. Um, excellent. And look, if you didn't have enough reasons uh, to be interested in, in Bumble yet, uh, we're going to come to Amy for one last question, and then we're going to go on to some of the questions that we've had through Zoom. Um, so Amy, what's the learning and development like at Bumble? Um, do you get a, a specific budget that you can use for, for L&D? It'd be great if you can give us a bit of insight into that side of things. Yeah, of course. So learning and development is something that is very, very important to us and something that we want to invest a lot in. Um, so currently, everybody in the business gets an annual learning and development budget. So within the UK, that amount is £2,000. 
and you can spend that however you want. So you can find it, it needs to be related to your role, obviously, um, but you can choose what courses you do, whether you spend that on one big project or whether you break it out into lots of smaller courses. And then you can just work to get approval. And if, if you need to take time off to go and attend a course, obviously that it doesn't come out of your annual leave, you get uh, the time off to do that as well. Um, and likewise, as I mentioned before, we really encourage um, everyone in the business, particularly within our engineering team, to be active and to be going to events, to be writing articles and to be building their personal brand as well as building our brand. And then we also do things like Focus Fridays, which I did touch on in the slides before my internet rudely kicked me off. Mm -hmm. um, so you can use that time again to focus on any areas where you think you need to develop a little bit more. Uh, we also have biannual reviews where we, we kind of review our performance and we work with our managers to see where we're up to. And then there's also the, the other side of it as well, which is um, something that our CEO and founder Whitney is really passionate about is our well-being. So, for example, she's given the whole company a week off next week just to kind of reset and recharge after we've all been working from home and working so incredibly hard during the pandemic. And that is really a really important part of your development as well is looking after yourself and having that time to step away. So um they all kind of roll into one but we're also very open to ideas so if there's you know if you were to join us and you, there's something that we're not doing that you think we should be you can always approach us and we will look to to implement that because it is something we're super passionate about amazing thank you very much um yeah really really nice ama section i think got some really good opinions from across the board um so we're going to do a few questions now that we've had via zoom um and then we'll end with a, a qr code which is going to be able to to give you guys out there a little bit more insight into, into what's going on um so first of all just focusing a bit on the error handling side of things uh so chitra if we've come to you first um how do you implement your your error handling uh, yeah, so like most things, it's also an um, in-house solution. So uh, first of all, for mobile apps, uh, I will cover how we, how it works. So we have some sort of error handling in the networking layer. So everything goes to the networking layer. And if any error comes to the networking layer, it takes over and presents the correct error. Um, right. And other than that, when we are coding, uh, we are also expecting code to work in a certain way. And if we think that the code is should is doesn't work like this, we use a wrapper or around assertions and this gets sent to our uh, error handling the systems and we can analyze there if if code is not working in a certain way that we expect it to. We also have anomaly detection tools. So if if at all um, uh, so there are some sort of alerts generated as well, if if some services start breaking and whatnot, we we are monitoring how much uh, the uptime of the server and whatnot. So everything is being monitored uh, using some in-house solutions. Um, so yeah, it, it, there's there's an interesting thing I wanted to say on this that when I first came to Bumble and I was um, you know developing and I was like oh what should the error state of the screen look like what should happen when when error happens and everyone was like why would it break so there was such confidence that things generally work to start with which was very different from wherever I had worked before. So this was quite interesting that uh, that generally things don't break. They are they are written in such a way. There are lots of tests and whatnot. And secondly, if it works, then there is some 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 uh, abstractions at networking layer which take care of it. So in day to day development, we don't have to care about it too much. Um, yeah, and and still, if we face errors, we send it to a system where we can monitor that in in production something didn't happen the way we expected and, and fix it. So this is also done in, in release monitor. So after every time a, re, uh, a release is sent, for one week we monitor various things, how it's performing. So that's another thing that we take care of. Yeah, that's it. Perfect. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, and Radek, just on your side of things, um, any differences at all in, in kind of how your team influence your, your error handling? Yeah, like actually great answer by Chitra. It was very, very rough, everything. Uh, I would just to like to clarify, if, maybe not clarify, but just, just to feel a few, few layers that, uh, that are very interesting uh, from, from my point of view as well. Like, um, for example, uh, like we have error handling based uh, on the server layers as well. So, for example, uh, if we have few micro services, for example, one that handles, uh, handling votes on the users and this kind of items, they have their own error handling that are presented for us as well. And they are very much connected to what's happening on the client, which is very, very insightful. 
and we can access them obviously via like uh, database queries and this kind of stuff, but also are presented for us via graphs, uh, which you can monitor uh, on a daily basis. And then like as Chitra said, we have anomaly detection on top of that, which kind of is very proactive. It's, it's, uh, it, has this, it has this push mechanism that kind of notifies us that, okay, this data is not expected here, right? We don't want this many errors here. So, so this is very, uh, very important. And one of the, like, um, I guess, interesting mechanisms we have is uh, on the image loading error handling, where if client have a problem to fetch an image, we send this URL to server and server tries to fetch it on their own. And thus they collect the data why the image is not valid. So we have like very detailed error handling on the server side, which is very cool. Um, yeah, and I, I will wrap it up here. Maybe just mention that we don't use exceptions in Swift, which uh, can be a question. And yeah, and we don't, and we silence assertions on, on production, but uh, the assertions uh, and we convert them into logs, which is uh, can be fetched later. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, and Alexis, if we could come to you last, just to, to wrap things up, if you give us a bit of insight into kind of the approach to testing, you know, what's your process for testing and, and finding bugs within the application? Yes, surely. That's a good question. Um, especially, I'm glad to answer this one because I would like to mention that we have a couple of amazing teams, uh, QA and automation, and they help us uh, trying to avoid any kind of bugs uh, pre-release. Um, they take care of the application and the testing of it, um, doing automatic tests. In the past, we used to do quite a lot of manual testing and uh, iterations and regressions, but we switch uh, to a more automatic uh, way of uh, doing the regressions. So depending on the stage where uh, the bug could appear, we can take different actions. So for example, if we will have a bug before release, uh, that is detected by our automation team is reported and then we fix it um, before such release or um, we merge this bug, fix it to the uh, branch where uh, this belong. If it's in a release uh, branch, we will send it uh, to the release. Uh, if it will be a regular bug, we just fix it and send it to master. But there are other type of bugs that happens in production. And for that, uh, we used to rely in the past in a tool called Hockey App, which is um, one of the most famous in the market. But uh, we found out that at some point we found out that uh, we needed a bit more power from for ourselves, more custom solution. So we created a solution and we switched it from Hockey App to our own solution that maybe release open source at some point. We are thinking about it and it's giving us a lot of uh, information about any bugs that are happening. So we can uh, query these bugs and uh, create tickets from there to fix them and assign to the proper team who will fix the bug. So everything is quite automatic. And we try to keep the uh, rate of the ratio of bugs uh, very, very, very low. So uh, I don't know exact numbers, but I can tell that in the last year, we decreased uh, more than uh, like 10%. So uh, now we are keeping very low numbers and I will say that compared to other applications where I uh, worked before, um, the current situation is really, really good in terms of uh, bugs. So I guess everything is more or less under control. Perfect. Thank you very much, Alexis. Um, and now I believe Amy has a brief slide to show us um, and give you guys out there some insight into uh, the roles that are available at Bumble at the moment. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight, I would have showed you this slide before, um, but sadly I got kicked off. So I just wanted to highlight some of the open roles that we have. I know a few people asked uh, which teams we're hiring in. You can view all of these roles and roles across all of our teams and locations at team.bumble.com. So please do go to the website, check it out, uh, find out more about info about the company. And if you see a role here that you like the look of, please do apply. Um, and then I'm just going to also show you this QR code so you can scan this and it will take you straight to our website, but it's team.bumble.com. Super easy to remember. And I apologize for running over, but I honestly could talk to you all day long about why you should come and work at Bumble because it's great. So thank you very much.
Lovely, thank you. Um, and and yeah, if anyone does want to talk to Amy all day long about why they should uh, join Bumble, please do scan that, that QR code and, and get involved because I think, um, you know, I've done a lot of these webinars. I think this is one of the most engaging, one of the most informative that we've, we've done. Certainly some really good information in there. So um, thank you very much to all of our panelists today. Thank you very much to everyone who's attended. Uh, big thanks from, from Hacker Job and Bumble uh, for, for, for getting involved. Um, and yeah, see you all next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.